All right. So uh, we'll do attendance today um, at some point in time. Can everyone see the board all right? Oh, yeah. Do you all want do you all want to? Yeah, let's just slide that whole thing down or make it so you can see. We'll probably have to do that every day. And if you want, you can, you know, make a row. Are you okay like that? You sure? Okay. Everyone else is okay? Just let me know. We can cut, you know, another light and open up the blinds if we need to. Um, okay, so we left off in 7.5. I sent an email out. I think I've sent at least one email too, because I said my office hours is going to run a little late today. Um, they're, they're having these review sessions on factoring and solving linear equations in the tutoring lab. So I sent an email about that. Um, it's optional, but if you attend one of those sessions, what happens? You get five point bonus on your first exam. So just read your email. Okay, anybody not know how to check their email? Well, for this class, you, you go into ACES, then you go into that Canvas place, oh. right, where our syllabus and stuff was. Top right corner says inbox. Click on that, and it should have emails there. Um, okay, so 7.5 is where we finished, and we're ready to try to do another example, and we're going to move into 8.1. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off here today by kind of going back a little bit. Remember, we had first talked about domains and excluded values. So I would like to look at this example here. Find the domain. of the function f of x equals x squared minus 9x plus 18 all over x squared plus 8x minus 9. <clears throat> Was anyone, uh, did anyone go back and look at the video from last class just to see that it exists out there? You may have noticed that when I first put it out there, the top half was cut off. Who sent me that email? Someone, okay. There's some problem, I, I, haven't, I don't have it resolved yet, but they upgraded the system I'm using and for some reason it's, it's hit and miss. I'll upload it, It'll, it won't work. The next video I upload, it works. I haven't figured it out, I have a meeting with them today. So if after class I upload the video and it comes back cut off half, don't worry, I know and I'm working on it, okay? Um, so just, just kind of an FYI for you on that. Um, let's get back to this, sorry. Finding the domain. So what we, what we said last class is when you're looking at a function, the thing that we were concerned about was the possibility of division by zero, right? We don't want that to happen with these rational functions. So in order to address that, what we always do is we focus on the denominator. Okay, in this case, the denominator is x squared plus 8x minus 9. And what we do is we plug in, or I'm sorry, we take that expression x squared plus 8x minus 9, and we ask ourselves, what would make that zero, right? Because whatever makes that zero is where we're going to have a problem. And this turns out to be what we would call a quadratic equation, right? Quadratic because the highest power of the, of the variable is, is squared, right? Two. And so now the question is, do you have a way of solving quadratic equations? Have you learned one? Hopefully you have. Um, anybody want to volunteer an approach? Uh huh. Okay, AC method is one way. Okay, so what you're doing is you're factoring the left side. Okay, AC method. Okay, guess and check method, that's still a factoring of the left side. What else? Completing the square, no? Yeah. Completing the square, now that, n nobody really ever cares for completing the square, right? 
And then the ultimate way to solve any quadratic equation is the quadratic formula, right? We've heard of all this. So it's your choice here. I'm going to do this by AC method because that was the first thing that was brought up. So the AC method, I'm trying to factor the left side here. I want to factor this. And so the AC method says that you look at the number in front of x squared, which is 1. You look at the number in the back, which is 9. And you multiply those two together, right? 1 times 9, that gives you 9. Then you take the number that appears in the middle in front of the x, which is 8. And you write that down over here also. Now, depending on how you were taught AC method, some instructors would do something like that. How many of you saw something like that where they did a little cross? Okay, not many. Some, some variation of it, right? What you're trying to do is come up with two numbers, right? Two numbers that multiply to be 9 but add up to be 8. Is that correct? Oh, I'm sorry. Wh what did I mess up? I messed up something here. Who's going to correct me? What did I mess up? It's not 9. It's negative 9. Thank you. Why is it negative 9? Well, because there was a negative there in front of the 9. So you need to take the positive 1 in front and the sign here, negative 9. Mm -hmm. So what two numbers multiply to be negative 9 add up to be positive 8? That'll multiply to be positive 8, though. 9 and negative 1. 9 and negative 1. Do you all see that? So, look, this is called factoring. And if you are sitting here going, what the hell is he doing? Right? That's why that session that I was just talking about, that free session that I emailed about, five points on your exam, they have, like, multiple sessions on different days, different times. Go sit in on one of those because we're not here to relearn factoring today. Um, that's called the AC method for factoring. We're going to continue. Once we have that, uh, depending again how you were taught, you now take this left side here. I'm just going to rewrite it. And <clears throat> using the two numbers that we got, 9 and negative 1, we're going to rewrite that 8 in the middle that's in front of the x, we're going to rewrite it using 9 and negative 1. So it goes like this. 8x squared, I mean, sorry, x squared plus 9x's minus 1x minus 9. So what we're trying to get to you to see here is that 9x take away 1x is still 8x. But what does that allow me to do now that I've split that 8x into two more terms? How, how many terms do I have total now? Four, and how do you factor something using four terms, with four terms? Does that help? Grouping. Grouping. So grouping works by drawing a slash right after the x, looking at what can you factor out of the first two terms there. What, can you, what, what do both the first and second term right here, what do they both have in common? An x. So I can pull an x out. If I pull an x out, I'm left with x plus 9. Now look at <clears throat> the negative x minus 9 over here on the right. What can you pull out of both of those? A negative 1, right? If you pull a negative 1 out, you'll be left with x plus 9. And what we're trying to get is for the thing that's in parentheses to be the same on both, right? If the x plus 9 and x plus 9 are the same, then what you write on the next line is the x plus 9 in parentheses, and then what? x minus 1 in parentheses. And where does the x minus 1 come from? The x and the minus 1. Again, this is a review topic, so I'm not trying to teach this to you. I'm hoping you've seen this. Now, if you learn guess and check, and you're happy with that, go for it. I'm not here to say you have to do it this way. What you do need to be able to do is, if you're going to factor for this problem, you need to get from that top line down to this line, however you want to get there. OK? 
Okay, now equals what? Zero still? Going back to the idea that we had an equation. And once you factor something out, x plus 9 times x minus 1 equals 0, you can now set each of the factors equal to 0. And then solve each of those little equations. So on the first equation, just subtract 9 on both sides. X is negative 9. And then on the right side, add 1 to both sides. So X is 1. So your two answers are negative 9 and positive 1. Yep. And that's all we have to look at. Okay? When you're looking at domains, we're wondering when is the denominator 0? We have just determined that these are the two places that the denominator is 0. So these turned out, remember from last class, to be called our excluded values, right? Yes? The domain are all the numbers, all the real numbers that can be plugged into the function, for which the, all the real numbers for which the function is well-defined. If you try and plug these in, the function d divides by zero and you can't do that. Everything except those. Every number except that. So instead of saying everything except those, I'm just saying exclude those. It's kind of the same thing. The, the assumption is that it's everything excluding this. And positive one. Yep. That's right. That okay? So in the, pr in the previous class, we did a problem like this, but it, we, didn't, we didn't have to factor. Like we didn't have to break down the denominator like we did here. All right, so I wanted to give you an example of that because your homework assignment has one like this in it. All right? Okay, next thing. Now let's get back to kind of what your quiz was over um, and give you a problem to look at here. How about something like this? Let, let's just warm up by starting with this one. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. The numerator. You don't have to worry about the numerator. That's right. Because if the numerator is zero, that's okay. Because remember, you can have a zero on top. You just can't have a zero on the bottom. So we don't really even look at it. All right. Here we go. Next example. Uh, 12 over x. This can look very much like your take-home quiz. Minus 3 over 4 equals 42 over 4x. And the instructions here are solve. So this is not a function, right? This is an equation. It's a rational equation because it has fractions in it. Your variables down on the bottom. So you need to be able to identify this. I mean, we have to think long term here. At some point, you're going to take a test. That test is going to cover a lot of different topics. So when this problem is, is presented in a test, I'm not going to say, hey, remember, this is when you do this. You're going to have to be able to look at it and know what to do. So we look at this. We see the equal sign. That makes it an equation. We see the fractions in there. That makes it a rational equation. Anytime we have a rational equation, we have a set of steps. And those steps... That's what I was hoping to see on here, and I see a lot of these have them. That's good. Step one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So here are the six steps. Here I go. Step one is to do what? Find the excluded values. So for our excluded values, we're going to look at the denominators and ask ourselves, what will make those zero? So one thing you could do is you could just list them out. Take that first denominator. Say, what makes that zero? Take the next denominator, 4, what makes that zero? Take the next one, 4x, what makes that zero? So you can set them each equal to zero. Now, some of these are trivial because it's not possible, right? Like, look at the middle one. 4 equals zero? That can't happen, right? Not today. So we can totally scrap that. How about the first one, x equals zero? That's it. That's, that's the excluded value. x is zero is your excluded value. And how about 4x equals 0? This one always seems to give people trouble. Divide, you can divide both sides by 4. What's 0 divided by 4? Careful. What is 0 over 4? Yep. 
undefines the other way, zero on the bottom. Remember what we had said, if you take a, uh, what was it, a cookie? What was it that we had? I gave you all this example, right? I didn't explain why zero wasn't defined. Okay, we need to talk about that then. Um, why can't you divide by zero in, in our number system? I mean, you've been told that, right? But why not? So let me try and help you. I'm going to stop here real quick because I think it's important that we understand why zero over four is okay, but four over zero is not okay. All right, so let's try and make it make sense. So I'm going to go back to like basic, basic idea of a fraction. Let's say I take a cookie and I want you to have half of it. What do I do? I take the cookie and I cut it into two pieces, right? So the two on the bottom here represents the number of pieces, right? Pieces, I before E. So is this IE? I, no, I don't, I don't even mess around with the IE. I gave up on that a long time ago. That's why I'm a math major. Because I that rule, I before E except after C, does not always work. Right? So it's not a rule. So why they call it a rule, I don't get it. Okay, that's why I, I just said forget English. I better go do something else. Okay, so that's how many pieces, right? The two? And then what about the one? What does the one represent? You're going to have one of those, right? So you take one of those two pieces, and that's what you have. You have half the cookie, right? Okay, now let's do another fraction over here. How about if I say zero over two? Well, the bottom, the two, is how many pieces, right? So I'm gonna say I want two pieces from that cookie, correct? And how many am I gonna take? None, so how much do I have? Zero, nothing. So that's why zero over two is zero, and that's okay. It's okay to you know show a little kid a cookie and say, mm, here, you nope, can't have any, right? As opposed to one half, you break in half, give them half, they get half a cookie, right? Now, does this make sense? How about, how about one over one? So you take a cookie, right? How many pieces do we want? So I'm not going to cut it, right? I'm just going to leave it there. And how much am I going to take? One. So I get that whole piece, right? So you get the whole cookie. That makes sense that that's one? Now let's try where we have the problem. If I do 2 over 0, then I have a cookie, right? How many pieces? 0. So how do you get 0 pieces? when We've always started with a cookie, right? And said, how many pieces do we want from that cookie? 2 pieces. So how can you take 2 if you don't even have anything to start with? Does that make sense? That's kind of a very, very generic way of explaining why we can't divide by 0. All right? Hopefully that is better than just someone telling you you can't. So when we go back up here, sorry, and we look at that 0 over 4, 0 divided by 4 is what? 0. So that gives me x equals 0, which I already had, didn't I? So that's okay. I got the same answer twice. That's no big deal. That's our excluded value. Excluded. So no matter what happens from here on out, no matter what happens, my answer can't be 0. All right, uh, where the heck are we? Step two, right? Step two, we want to find the LCD, don't we? I'm going to rewrite the problem here. So when we do LCD, we can look at the denominators kind of one, of a, one at a time. I need an X, right? I need an X, so here's an X. I need a 4. So here's a 4. I put the 4 in front of the x. And then the last one says I need, I need a 4 and an x next to each other, which I already have, right? So that 4x should cover all three denominators. With me? Okay, now what do we do in step 3 once we have that denominator? Multiply both sides by it, right? So what I did last time is I wrote out the original equation again. And then I came in with a big set of parentheses on the left side, and I put the 4x in front of it. And we said it was really like a 4x over 1. And on the right side, I didn't use a parentheses. Why? Why am I not using a parentheses on the right side here? Because it's only one term. 
I need the parentheses on the left because you must distribute that 4x over 1 through. Questions? Distribute. And then here you multiply straight across. Now, let's go ahead and do this multiplication. Again, you may just know that you can cancel things and everything's great, but I'm going to do it kind of like the slow, methodical way right now. What is 4x times 12? 48x. So I'll put that here, 48x over 1 times x, which is x. So that's your first blue. I don't know if y'all can even see that that's blue, but your first multiplication through that parentheses, you get 48x over x. Then minus 4x times 3 is 12x over 4. And then equals 4 times 42. 168 x over 4x. Any questions on that? Yes. That's what I was saying just a second ago. If you could cancel stuff out right away, but I'm going to show the slow methodical approach. If you're, if you would have already just looked at this and said, "Hey, look." That 4x and that 4x go away, right? And then this x and this x will cancel. If you're okay with that, do it. If you do it in your head, that's fine, okay? Uh, next thing, let's reduce all these fractions. So the, on the first one here, the x's will cancel, right? How about the 12 over 4 in the second fraction? That'll become a 3 and then x. And then we can also cancel the x's on the last one. And we can also reduce the fraction 168 divided by 4. So I'm going to do all of that now. I'm left with a 48 minus 3x equals 42. Now we are faced with what would be called a linear equation. And I have to apologize because that whole cookie thing, I showed it to my other class that's, that's right after this class. So sometimes I might get confused of like, did I show you that or not? I, so sorry about that. Um, what now? Solve for x, right? So isolate x. That's how we do linear equations, right? We isolate x. So we're going to subtract 48 on both sides. That will still leave us with the negative 3x, but on the right side, if you have 42 and you take away 48, you're left with negative 6, right? Now divide both sides by negative 3, right? You all agree? Okay, and then you get final answer here, x equals what? Now, that was step four, sorry. Step four was the solving, wasn't it? Right here, I, I forgot to put my step four here to solve. Yeah, the question now in step five is, is x equal to excluded? Oh yeah, if you came in a little bit late, um, quiz that I asked for, thank you, you're good. Now, was that excluded? No, so our final answer would be would be 2. No is the answer. So in step 6, we're supposed to check it, right? So we plug it into the original problem. 12 over 2 minus 3 over 4. Does that equal 42 over 4 times 2 is 8? Right? Did I plug that into the right equation? 42 over 8. Right, I went back to the original problem, which is right there at the top. 12 over x minus 3 over 4 equals 42 over 4 times x. I replaced x with 2. So that's 12 over 2 minus 3 over 4 equals 42 over 8. Right, 4 times 2. Is that correct? 
It does check, right? It does? What's 12 divided by 2? 6 minus 3 fourths. Does that equal... Does 8 go into 42? No. So, how does it reduce? What re, how does it reduce? 21 over 4, right? Is that correct? Sorry, I know this is way down on the bottom of the page here. Where we are is 6 minus 3 fourths. Is that equal to 21 over 4? Is it? Yes. How, how would you verify that? You could take your 6, make it a 6 over 1, and get a common denominator between the 1 and the 4. So how, how could I rewrite 6 over 1 where it had a denominator of 4? 24 over 4, right? Minus 3 over 4. Does that equal 21 over 4? Yes. So what I did is I rewrote 6 as 24 over 4. Then subtracting, you get 24, take away 3, that's 21. So it does, it does check. Okay. <clears throat> Let's move on. We are actually, there's a lot more in this section, but I'm going off of what the department wants me to go over. And so that's the extent of these equations that they want me to cover. All right, so that's good, that's good news for you. Let's go to the new chapter we're going to start now. 8.1, or chapter 8. So let me tell you what chapter 8 is first. Chapter 8 is called Roots and Radicals. And 8.1 is called <coughs> simplif oh, what happened? Is called simplifying adding and subtracting square roots. All right, so we're going we're gonna to get in, in pretty deep here with roots, square roots today. And this is going to work a little different than what I just did. I'm going to kind of give, do a problem, let you do one or two or three, you know. So there will be a little more activity going on so you all aren't falling asleep, okay? Uh, first note here. Let's talk about what a principal square root is. Principal square root. So let's say, let's say that I write down here the square root of 4. Most people will say 2, right? Square root of 9, 3. Square root of 1, 1. Square root of 0. Zero. The square root of x squared should be x. So what does the square root symbol mean? Like when I say that first one, square root of 4, what am I really saying? Because the answer is 2, right? We're saying that when you take this 2, right, and when you square it, you should get back that yellow. So if I, take, if I take this 3 here, right, I square it, I get back the 9 by itself. So if I take the 1 here, square it, I get the 1 underneath the square root. The 0, see why the 0 works? Because what's 0 times 0? Still 0. And then for the last one here, what's x times x? It's x squared. Okay? So the principal square root is basically the positive answer of what's in there. 
Now, th here's why it's important that we understand this. Because what if I tell you this? Some number squared is 4. Can you tell me what x is? 2. But is that the only answer? What other answer? What other number when you square it do you get 4? I mean, 2 works. Watch. 2 squared, that equals 4. That I agree. But how about negative 2 squared? Does that equal 4? Yes. So whenever someone asks you this question, hey, what number squared equals 4? There's actually two answers, positive and negative 2, right? But when you come back over here, what we're looking at right here, these roots, if somebody writes the square root symbol over a number, the answer is always just the positive answer. Always. And that's what we call the principal square root. It's the positive answer only. Yeah. The only way we get the negative is if they ask this question on the right. So do you all see the difference between these? When, when we were looking at this square root of 4 equals 2, we said, oh, okay, if you square the 2, you get 4. But over here, you square negative 2, you also get 4. So just keep, just the big thing here is the principal root always returns the positive answer and you discard the negative. So let's take a couple of uh, examples here. I'm just going to keep this in here an example. I like for us to, to find the square root of 90. Careful. 30 times 30 will not give you 900. Or 90, sorry. It won't give you 90. So it might be helpful if you, if you knew what the, the perfect squares were, right? What are the, what are the perfect squares, everyone? One. one squared is one, two squared is four, three squared is nine, 16, five squared, 25, six squared, 36, seven squared, 49. How high can you go? Let's see, 8 squared, 9 squared, 81, 10 squared. Most people will know 10 squared is 100. Those are, those are the nice squares. That, they call them the perfect squares, right? These are the perfect squares. Um, so if someone asks you, what's the square root of 100? The answer is 10. If they say, what's square root of 36? You say 6. Now, I, I would only expect you to know up to like the first 10 or 11 perfect squares, but you would need to know those, like know them. After that, yeah, you have a calculator for that. So 90 is not a perfect square, is it? So the question is, how do we deal with square root of 90 without a calculator? And here's the way we'll do it. We take the 90 inside and we try and, we try and think of 90 as being the product of two numbers and try and make one of them a perfect square. But can you think of what two numbers multiply to be 90 with one of them possibly being off this list on the right side? 10 and 9, right? 10 and 9? I'm going to write the other way around, 9 times 10. Everyone agrees 90 is 9 times 10? So what I'm going to do is underneath that root, that square root symbol, I'm going to put... 9 times 10. Now, there is a property. It's called the product rule for radicals. It's in your book on page 523. And it says that if you have two things underneath the square root like that being multiplied, that you can split this into two separate square roots. Go ahead. 10's not. Yeah, I agree. We'll deal with that in a second. So that comes off of that property off page 523 called the product rule for radicals. Everyone okay with that? Now look at the square root of 9. That's basically asking what's the positive answer for that? 3. 3 times the square root of 10. Now 10 is not on your list, right? And 10 cannot be broken down, can it? Can 10 be broken down 
to two numbers where one of them is on this list. I mean, other than one and 10, right? Two and five, but two and five aren't on this list, right? I'm saying when I say on this list, I'm talking about the numbers on the right side here. You break it down, break the 10 down to be, let's say, two and five. Neither one of those appear on our list. So since 10 can't be broken down, we stop. And so our final answer is just the three and the root 10, and you do not have to put the dot between them. So this is called the simplified form. And that's what we're going to be trying to do. We're going to be taking a number like 90, and we're going to be trying to break it down in its simplified form. Questions? We're going to do another one. How about something like this? Square root of 180. So you might at some point want to have a calculator because you might want to mess with numbers and you may not be able to do them quickly enough in your head. So is 180 one of our perfect squares? No, so we're not lucky there. Um, so let's just try and break 180 down. 20 and 9? Okay, let me look at 12 and 15 also. You could do 2 and 90, right? The question is, from all of those, I mean, there's, there's probably more. Which of those is the best one to use? Because there is a best one up there. What did I say you wanted to look at with the numbers that you get down here? Is one of those a perfect square? Right? So the 20 and 9, your 9 is a perfect square, isn't it? The 12 and 5, I mean, sorry, 12 and 15, 12 and 15 are not perfect squares, right? 2 and 90, 2 is not a perfect square, 90 is not a perfect square. Agreed? 29 is probably our best candidate. So let's go, off, let's go off of that. Now, we may still not be done, okay? Now, th watch the way I'm going to write it. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. I'm going to write it backwards. I'm going to do the 9 times the 20 because that's the same thing, right? I only do that because that product rule where I split this into 2, what that's going to allow me to do is kind of dump that 3 out in front, which is where I want it. Do y'all see that? Okay. Now, we are not done until we now look at the 20 and make sure the 20 can't be broken down. So let me look at 20. Can you think of two numbers that multiply to be 20, 2 and 10? But that isn't very encouraging because neither 2 nor 10 are perfect squares. 4 and 5. Right? 4 and 5? Because 4 is a perfect square, isn't it? Any questions? No? Okay, so I'm going to take the 3. Now the 20, I'm going to rewrite it as a 4 times 5. Use the product rule again to break that down to be square root of 4 times square root of 5. And now at this point, what's the square root of 4? The principal root of 4. So that's going to be 3, 2, square root 5. Now, what is, it, what is the operation between the 3 and the 2 there? Multiplication. So I'm going to put the dot in there. 3 times 2 is what? 6, square root of 5. Any questions? Now you have to look at 5. Can 5 be broken down? 5 is prime, right? 5 is a prime number meaning that the only number that divides into 5 is 1 in itself, okay? So we cannot break 5 down to be perfect square. So we are done at this point. We are simplified.
I think it's your turn. So what I'd like for you to do is working together, you know, try and make a friend here. Let's go ahead and for you, you practice this. Square root 500. And then the other one, that's your first one. The second one, square root 98. All right. Go ahead, write those down first because I'm going to bring up the attendance thing and try and do my attendance. I realize some of you might be sitting somewhere else. That's, that's okay. We'll address that once I bring up attendance. All right, so the answers are, what do we get for the first one here? 10 root 5, and the second one is 7 root 2. Now, let me talk a little bit about the second one, because I think the second one is the one that causes the most trouble, only because most people can, can figure out two numbers that multiply to be 500, because you have a lot of different candidates for that, right? But the 98, it's like you sit there and you're like, what, what? How can I break down 98? So my recommendation, if you can't figure out how to break 98 down, is to get your calculator out and start dividing 98 by all the perfect squares. So by four first. Does four go into 98 on your calculator? Does it turn out to be a, an integer, a nice number? No, that doesn't work. So the next perfect square you divide by is the next, what's the next perfect square, nine? Nine does not go in there. Next perfect square is what? 16, that doesn't go in there. The next perfect square is 25. 25 doesn't go into 98. The next perfect square is 36. So you start to want to give up, right? But when you get to the, this one, 49. 49 goes in there twice. And that means that you can take the 98 here and break it down to be 49 times 2. Anyone else need to sign in? All right. Yes, you need to sign in. So what happens is our square root of 98 becomes square root of 49 times square root of 2. The square root of 49 is 7. The square root of 2 can't be broken down. Thank you. All right. Everyone feel okay with this? All right. You'll have, you'll have an opportunity in your homework to continue to practice that. Yes? So 500 can be broken down to be 100 times 5, right? Oh, how do you verbally say it? 10 square root 5, or 10 times square root of 5. Oh, square root of 500 equals 10, 10 root 5, or 10 times root 5, or 10 times the square root of 5. Yeah, that's how you'd say it. The square root of 500 equals 10 times the square root of 5. Usually we don't say 10 times, we say 10 root 5. All right, now the next thing. We want, to look at, we want to look at some square roots where we have some fractions because you enjoy those. So as your next example, how about if I put negative square root 9 over 25? Uh, it's not my idea. So here's the good thing about fractions with square roots. Kind of like when we had two things being multiplied, like when we had nine times, let's say, three, we broke it up into two square roots like this. You can do the same with division. So this 
this one here becomes equal to, now the negative is gonna sit out in front, negative. Now I'm gonna do the square root of nine on top and the square root of 25 on the bottom. So what is the square root of nine or the principal root of nine? Three, and what's the principal root of 25? Five. So your answer is just negative three fifths. Yeah, that, that worked out because I used nine and 25, right? Had it not been nine and 25, it might be a little more troublesome, but you're not gonna be faced with that, okay? It's just gonna be straight, pretty much it's gonna work. Any questions? Well, in college algebra, we'll just go right to a calculator. I mean, we, we won't even mess with the simplification. I do. Yep. Um, let's see. I think we, there's ants up here. Um, let's try the, let's try a little bit with, um, some variables. All right. So let's add some new stuff into this. This, this is where things can get a little bit tricky. We already said earlier, the square root of X squared was equal to what? X, right? What is the square root of X cubed? Hmm, that's not so clean, right? So watch the way I do this. Tell me if you agree with this. Isn't X cubed X squared times X? Isn't it? Right? Now, don't I have two things being multiplied inside of a square root? So can't I split this now into two square roots, x squared, square root of x squared times square root of x? And what did we say just a second ago what the square root of x squared was? It was x. So it's x root x, but you can't do anything with the root x. So you just get x root x. So the square root of x cubed is x root x. Make sense? What do you think the square root of x to the fourth is? Well, you could write that as x squared times x squared, couldn't you, underneath? We're going to come up with a pattern here, and we're going to be able to do these a little easier in a second. But that's true, right? x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. And then couldn't we split this into two? x squared, x squared, both under roots. So x times x. And what is x times x? x squared. How can what what? The square root of x to the fourth is x squared. Yes? Now there's going to be a pattern. It's going to start picking up here. Let's see how it goes. What's the square root of x to the fifth? You could write that as x square root of what? x squared times x squared times x, couldn't you? You could do that also. I can split this into square root x squared, square root x squared, square root x. What's square root x squared? What's this one right? What's square root x squared right there? X. So we have x. What's the next square root x squared? X. But we still have a square root x, which we can't break down. So what is x times x in front? x squared, and then we still have a root x. Can you kind of see it? So let me highlight our answers, okay? Square root of x squared was x. Here we had x root x, then x squared, then x squared. So let's look at those. Do y'all see kind of the blue? And then let me highlight on the left side in kind of green what we were taking the square root of. So when we did x squared, our answer was just x, right? 
we had 1x. That was our answer, right? And we did x squared. When we did x cubed, what did we have? 1x, right? We had, our answer had 1x in, as an answer. And then we still had 1x underneath the root, didn't we? Just, just hear me out. Let's keep going. On the next one, x to the fourth, how many, how many x's did we have? Two. With no square roots, right? No square roots in our answer. For x to the fifth, how many x squareds did we have on the outside here? I mean, how many x's? Two x's and one x inside. So what's happening is this. If, if you're taking the square root of x to, let's say, like 12, which is an even number, right? 12 is an even number then basically your answer is always going to be x to the half of that number, 6. It's basically you're asking yourself, how many times does 2 go into 12? Yeah, hold on. Let me go back up here. Look, when you look at x squared up there, right, you look at the 2 inside. How many times does 2 go into 2? Once. So our answer was just 1x. Now look at the 4 here. How many times does 2 go into 4? twice, so we had an x squared as an answer, right? x to squared. If we do x to the sixth, we should get an answer of what? Square root of x to the sixth should be x to the third. x to the twelfth, our answer is x to the sixth. The trouble is the odds. So what do we get when we did x cubed? So I want to I want to think through this. How many times does two go into three? Just one time, right? One time, but it leaves you with one, doesn't it? So do you see how our answer, right here, I'm circling it here. See our answer had one X on the outside and then one was left over inside the root still? On an odd. On an odd, you'll always have a square root left over. Well, let's, let's see what x to the, let's do square root of x to the 7. So what you ask yourself is this. How many times does 2 go into 7? Three times. So I'm going to say x cubed. But I had one left over, right? That gets stuck inside the, the square root. One x left over. That's it. Now, if I had just said that's what you do, I could have done that, I guess, right? But I'm trying to show you, like, where it comes from. So, go ahead. How many times does 2 go into that power? So let's try this one. x to the 522nd power. What's the square root of x to the 522nd power? So how many times does 2 go into 522? So you get on a calculator or whatever it is, right? x to the... 261. That's the answer. Okay? Now, what about the square root of x to the 523? So how many times does 2 go into 523? Well, it doesn't, right? It goes in 261 times with one left over. So you'd have a root x out here. Well, there's only a pattern for even and odd. That's it. If it's even, it's just half of the power. If it's odd, it's kind of like half of the power plus one, but you can't take half of the odd. Yes. Yeah. Wait, the last one? X to the fifth power? So look at the x to the fifth power. I said to myself, how many times does 2 go into 5? Well, it only goes in twice, right? So I put an x squared on the outside. But I still have one left over because 2 times, if it goes in twice, 2 times 2 is 4, which it's 5. I have one left over. That's the x in here. Okay. Okay, I see what you're saying. From one line to the next. I see what you're saying. Yes, that's correct. If you just look at this, the next one, 
would be x cubed, then x cubed root x, then x to the fourth, x, I see that. That would be a recurse, we call that a recursive pattern. The problem with something like that is to know what's next, you have to know the one before it, right? Okay, any questions on that? Yes? Always use two, because it's a square root. Now, if it were a cube root, that would be a different section, different, to different, totally different conver conversation. And we're not talking about that today. All right, so let's try this now. What is the... Square root of 24b to the 11th power. So I'm using, I'm using some different letters here. Instead of x, I'm using b, but it's the same thing, okay? Now, I also threw something in there. Instead of having just the variable, I have a number in there also. So here's the way we're going to approach it. We're going to take the square root of 24 times the square root of b to the 11. So we're going to split it up into two. Why are we, why are we allowed to do that? Because it's multiplication, correct. Because there's multiplication side, 24 times b to the 11th, I can now use that product rule that says split it into two. Now, the reason I like to do that is because the square root of 24 is a problem that we would have started with here, right? That, like, I went around and passed out to everyone. We took a little break. Everyone did that, right? 500 and what was the other one? 98. So that we know how to do, right? We have to break down 24, find two numbers. We can figure that out. The b to the 11th is like the x to the 11th. We're just going to do that the other way. So let's do the b to the 11th first since that's the more, the, the, the fresher thing in our heads. We ask ourselves what? How many times does 2 go into 11? Five times, but you'll have one left over. So I'm going to write what? B to the, how many times did we say it went in? Fifth power. But then we had one left over, so I need to write what? Square root B. Good. That makes sense? Now let's take care of that 24. So I'm going to do this on the side here. 24, I need to try and break that down. Two numbers, hopefully one of them's prime. Six and four, everyone agree? Four is a prime number. I mean, why am I say prime? Um, I meant to say perfect square. Apologies there. So I'm going to rewrite my 24 now, and I'm going to rewrite it as, I'm not going to say six times four, I'm going to do four times six. That's just my personal... I like to always put the perfect square in front because my next line is going to be the perfect square by itself then the other one. Then I still have the b to the fifth root b. What is the square root of four? Two. Two. Square root of six. So we'll have to deal with that in a second. b to the fifth root b. Can you break six down to be two numbers where one of them is a perfect square? You can go two and three, but neither one are a perfect square. So when that happens, we're done. This is not the final answer yet. Because what we have to do for a final answer is put the two, the things that don't have a root together. So I'm putting the two and the b to the fifth together. And then what about the 6 and the b that are both underneath the root? Yes, we'll put them back together under one root. We'll actually do that product rule backwards just to clean it up so we don't have two roots, we make one. So we put back together the 6 and the b underneath a single root. Is that okay? And this is our simplified form. Okay, let me discuss the homework. Um, if you go off the schedule, who has, did anyone print off the schedule by any chance? No, not yet. Okay, I'll just tell you what the homework's going to be here. The homework for tonight is, homework is never 
turned in, but it should always be brought to class. Oh, you can put it in your spiral. That's fine. All right. Here's what I'd like for you to do. Uh, page 495. Let's do... Where is it? Let's do nine and let's do 13, 17, 19. Okay, that's all stuff that we did with uh, domain excluded value stuff and then solving equations. So that's out of 7.5. And, uh, and then off of page 529, we're going to do problems 11 through 21 odd. That says that's odd, O-D-D, -D, okay? Um, then we'll do 27 through 37 odd. Then let's do 65 through 79 odd. Now with technology and stuff the way it is these days, if you ever just want to take a picture of the board when you leave, that's fine on your phone. Um, my expectation, unless I tell you otherwise, is always that you will have completed this before you come to class next time. All right? So if you have any problems with this, get in touch with me before next class. Because I could just walk in here on, uh, what, Wednesday, right? Monday's a holiday. We could walk in here on Wednesday, and I could give you a quiz off of one of these homework problems, if I wanted to, right? Have a good uh, weekend.